Welcome to Social Distance Assistance. I'm Kelly. And I'm June. School is closed, the theater too. What are the actors supposed to do? How do we go on with the show? So yeah, that's the sound of me rehearsing a show I'm going to be in next weekend. You might be wondering how I managed to do musicals when all the theaters are closed. We go online, set the lights, fill the screen. The show must go on, the show must go online. (laughs) Ah, sorry. So there is a company, and it's a company that normally writes musicals for students, that as soon as they found out we might be at home for a while, they decided to write a musical about students who could not put on their show. That's Melissa Charles, talking about a musical called The Show Must Go Online. She's directing me in it, and she runs the musical theater school I go to called DMR Adventures. The DMR stands for Dreams Made Real. My goal is always to get the show up and running, no matter what problems we run into, because there's always problems. So that was one of the hardest things when this all happened was like, we can't physically do the show that we plan to do. And it's so hard. How how will we get by? How will we ever do it? Piece by piece, scene by scene, the show must go on, the show must go online. I love the idea of this story, the show must go online, because the kids really understand that mantra of the show must go on. And so they decide that they're going to adapt and be creative and figure out a way to keep going. So that's what the show is about, which just reminds me of this generation in general. DMR is a huge part of my life. I'd go there a couple times a week and take singing lessons, acting lessons, and dancing lessons. I've been in a few shows. It's the hard knock life for us. I was really excited about the upcoming season and classes. My dream role is Lil Gavroche from Les Mis. And if you're ever going to see me play him at the Kennedy Center, I've got some work to do. A worm can roll a stone. A bee can sing a bear. A fly can fly around for Zach's flies. Don't care. Not getting any littler. Can make a happy home. A flea can wipe the bottom of the Pope in Rome. And then came COVID. Every part of my life seemed to shut down. No school, no playground, no kung fu, no playdates. Except Melissa sprung into action. Within days, or maybe it was hours, of closing the theater, she was online running acting classes, coordinating dance lessons with choreographers in New York, staging virtual read-throughs of musicals with all my DMR friends and castmates. I wouldn't say that I made a conscious decision to move everything online at first. My decision was just that we needed to stay connected with our students immediately because everyone is feeling a little bit lost, very lonely. Let's try to do whatever we can to get connected. We have a youth leadership committee at DMR Adventures, which is made up of middle school and high school students who are really committed to the arts. So I immediately reached out to those students And I don't know that I came up with a plan to program something seven days a week. I think that was their idea. Even though I think maybe it was a bit much to decide to do something every single day of the week. Um, On the other hand, it was like I had made an appointment. I had to make sure I was up and had energy. I probably needed to make sure I had had coffee by that point. And that I was in a place where I could communicate. And I tend to, if I'm home or isolated for a long time and I don't have something planned, I can kind of go down into a dark place. And so having these appointments and knowing that I needed to show up for other people has helped me every single day. And now we're about to do The Show Must Go Online. It's a show about kids who are in the same situation I am. The theater is closed, but they want to keep performing. I'm playing a kid who tries to make her cat as a prop and a kid who thinks a toothbrush with googly eyes will make a great cast member. This is a time for us to be creative and and to adapt. So for this particular show, what we've decided is to pre-record 
pieces and put them together. So that's very much like working on film. But we don't have big production. We don't have hair and makeup. We don't have a separate sound unit coming in to film us. So it's very raw. And I think there is something big that's missing from virtual theater. And that is the reaction from the audience. Normally, when we perform live theater, we have a whole other group of people there reacting and responding and fueling the energy of the performance. Much like when I teach a class, the students really give me the energy to keep teaching. I think the audience often gives us the energy to keep going as performers. And so I'm, I'm both scared and excited to see how that's going to work in virtual theater because we still have to keep going, but it's going to look a little different. My quarantine would really look different if I didn't have Melissa and DMR in my life. And not only because my family would get really tired of me staging one kid renditions of Newsies in the living room. Yes, you can do theater anywhere. You don't need a stage. And that's something I've always preached to our students. And one of the reasons I love performing in a black box theater is because it forces us to be creative and think outside the box. You know, you can produce Les Mis in your living room. Why not? You can do Little Red Riding Hood in your backyard. You can do The Show Must Go Online in your bedroom. There's no need to have a big stage to put on a show. There's kind of no excuse. We can see that it can be done. Being able to keep doing musical theater, my art, has made me feel safer. Everybody. Sure, it gives me something to do, but it also keeps me connected to my friends and fellow artists. It lets me know that they are safe, too. Today on the show, we're going to hear from artists who are making art in spite of social distancing and who are getting really creative with it. We'll talk to a photographer who's taking portraits of people on their porches. Just one more. From this angle, I want to get the flowers. I want to incorporate the flowers into this shot. An illustrator who's drawing COVID survivors who he's never met. It's not about not looking at the pain and the difficulty that the situation is bringing. It's about looking at how we can navigate through this and see that there's a recovery at the end. An opera singer who has turned his lawn into a stage. And I said, don't go out there with your small speaker and just do some innocuous jazz. And we'll ask whether art even matters during a pandemic. Spoiler alert, it absolutely does. Why do you think people need performing arts right now? I think the performing arts builds a lot of important skills. Creativity, imagination, adaptability. And we definitely need those things right now because we don't really know what lies ahead. The other thing is that The arts allows us to express our emotions in a way that maybe we can't in our normal lives. It allows us the opportunity to build empathy and understanding for other people. And those are always important. But especially right now, there's a lot of anxiety, confusion. And so I think the arts allows us to build on those important human characteristics that we all really, really need at this time. Even though we're far apart, we can still connect through art. Take a breath and get in the zone. We will show we can't contain our deep desire to entertain each description. A teenager wakes up from a coma. A prisoner of war comes home. A Buddhist Lama emerges after years of silent, isolated meditation. Each of these people has struggled to reintegrate with society. Can We All Come Out Now is a new podcast that prepares us for reintegration through the stories of those who have done it before. Subscribe to Can We All Come Out Now today, wherever you get your podcasts. Back in March, photojournalist Eze Amos was sitting home alone in Charlottesville, Virginia, being, well, bored out of his mind. 
He was desperate to get out and take some photos, but all the events, protests, and weddings that he usually shoots, everything was canceled. Eze started Googling around for pandemic art inspiration and came across a series by Kara Sulia in Massachusetts called The Front Steps Project. Basically, a photo shoot where you're on your porch and a photographer is at a safe distance, documenting a part of your life during the pandemic. Eze thought, this is it. I can totally adapt this project for Charlottesville. He put out a call for participants on social media, got a few porch portraits posted to Instagram, and before long, requests from people around the city to come and take their picture started rolling in. Then Eze thought, I wonder if other local photographers are bored and would be interested in joining me. They were. Now, Eze and four other photographers hit the streets of Charlottesville every day to take porch portraits. It started small, just with people they knew who found them on Instagram. But these days, Eze finds himself taking photos of people he's never met. People who are looking to connect with a stranger and who want to show the community that they're making it through. We asked Eze to keep an audio diary during his latest trip into the field. Um, packing up my gears here. I'm getting ready to go um, do a, a porch photo of a friend of mine, a dear friend of mine. I, I didn't know it was going to be a major project. I thought it was going to be something small. I thought it was going to be probably like, probably like 50, 60 photos and everybody would be happy. Yay. And then it just blew, as in there was a week, like two straight weeks that I was photographing. Daily, I was doing at least 15 photos. It was crazy. It just blew up and, and everybody wanted to be part of this. And uh, almost 850 photos later, uh, we're here. All right. I got some freshly charged batteries. Yay. I think they've, they've all been fun. Um, I really enjoyed the one I did with Brandon, the very first one. It was really, really cool. Uh, mm. Being able to see a friend that I hadn't seen in a while, you know, being able to like talk to them and then photograph them. And and if you know Brandon, my friend, he's, he's a very goofy guy. He he was just having fun with it and stuff. And it was, it was just cool. My lenses, check. Extra camera, check. Yeah, I think I'm ready to hit the road. Oh, where's my wallet? Yeah, I photographed uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, moving, you know, photos of, you know, for, for people that have said amazing things or told me, you know, because people just want to talk. You know, you, you roll up to them and they just want to say something like, hey, what you're doing is great. Oh, I haven't seen anybody that I know in forever. Thank you for doing this and all that. I like driving this country road. It's just good to be out in the country and fresh breeze blowing. Yeah, I'm pulling into to Beth's place now. Hey, Liza. How are you? Good to see you. Basically, this project is it's it's gone from just being my project or our project to uh, a community, a Charlottesville project. And you can tell from how you know people react to it and they talk about you know what this project has done for them. It's kind of you know, a way for them to see that the community is doing well. They see people they know smiling, sitting in front of their homes and with their kids, having fun. And they see all those photos and just kind of uh, uh, uplifts their spirits and just uh, gives them hope that, you know, this community would make it in the end, that will come out of this uh, better. All right, here we go, guys. Yeah, there you go. Just one more. From this angle... I want to get the flowers. I want to incorporate the flowers into this shot. Let's see. Huh, yeah. Now I can get everybody in it. Yes. Yes, I love that. I love that. <laughs> this project has helped me personally because uh, I live alone and uh, it's kind of like the one thing I needed to just get me, just kind of like keep me from going insane because uh, just sitting at home in my, my apartment alone, um, God, it's it's just it gets too much sometimes. But being able to go out there and meet people, photograph them, you know, come home, edit those photos. And the cool thing about editing photos is every time you're editing a photo, you 
you're reliving that moment again because you see those faces you you remember what you said to them while they're smiling or why that kid has a smile on his face it was because i said something and then the kid smiled and you got the shot so it's it's been it's brought me a lot of joy and i've really really enjoyed working on this project i'm gonna come a little closer to you here and shoot wide just one more and i will leave you alone one thing i could say about the role of arts um during this crazy time that we're going through is um the ability to tell stories for me i think uh, this project is um still in the story of uh family, people coming together, people staying as one, uh, Charlesville, the community as a unit. You know, I post a photo of somebody and hundreds and hundreds of people say nice things about those people. Like, wow, it's good to see your face. Oh, I know that guy. He comes to my shop. Oh, blah, blah, blah. It's a way of like bringing communities together without actually bringing them together. It's a way of like having people interact without actually being there. <laughs> All right. Oh, look at you all smiling. This is so cool. I got it. That's it. Thank you very much. If you're local, you can hire Aze or any of the four other photographers now taking Civil Porch Portraits. Sign up at civilporchportraits at gmail.com. Session prices are on a sliding scale, anywhere from zero to 250 because as Aze says he just wants to take your picture half of the proceeds go to the charlottesville emergency relief fund for artists who've lost income because of covid look through the porch portraits on instagram and find us on our porch at seville portraits that's c-v-i-l-l-e-p-o-r-c-h-r-a-i-t-s From the front porch to the yard. Pretty much every weekday, Stephen Wall walks out of his house in Seattle, stands in the middle of his lawn, six feet from the sidewalk, and starts belting out songs. Stephen Wall is an opera singer. He started giving evening concerts in early April after Seattle got stay-at-home orders. Audio producer Hans Anderson talked to the tenor about what led him to start this strange tradition. At a few minutes before 5 p.m., neighbors come out of their homes and sit on their porches. People walking dogs find space, six feet away from others, of course, and take a seat on nearby lawns. Families pushing strollers stop and wait. A car pulls up and rolls down their window. I haven't seen it from this angle. <laughs> They're all here to see Stephen Wall, or as he's come to be known, the Ballard Opera Man. Ballard being the neighborhood in Seattle where he lives. Hi, my name is Stephen Wall. I came to Seattle in 1979, and in 1981, I did my first performances with Seattle Opera. I sang a performance in January of 2020, and that was my 99th production with the opera in my 39th year with the company. And then things changed. Wall is still performing though he won't get to his 100th performance with the Seattle Opera anytime soon. Instead, he has an audio mixer and speakers set up in his front yard. He does a quick sound check, playing his accompaniment tracks off an iPad. Then he begins with his first song, George Frederick Handel's Sound and Alarm. Sound and alarm, your silver trumpet sound. On any given weekday, weather permitting, he's out on his front lawn at 5 o'clock sharp, singing. The performances started in early April. Wall had been giving vocal lessons online, something that has been difficult to adjust to. Zoom doesn't necessarily handle loud singing well. He's had to slow down his teaching. Because if, if you keep going at this fast, frenetic pace that you might have in person, the, the buffering is just going to flip out and everyone's learned to go, Zay. You know, and when that, this has become the new normal. Wall also gives lessons in a dark room, so one sunny day, he went outside to practice jazz on the string bass, which is a hobby of his. With the idea that I didn't want to disturb people, the idea that I would play this music and it wouldn't be 
interruptive to people going by on the sidewalk with their dogs or just walking in the exercise. And what happened was the people who would stop and hear me playing jazz bass, bike riders would go, yeah, jazz, that's great. Now, people in Seattle have a reputation of being a bit standoffish. There's even a name for how locals like to keep to themselves. It's called the Seattle Freeze. So strangers talking to him. I thought, this is not typical Seattle. And then I was watching the PBS NewsHour, and there was a, a guy in Naples, Italy, when that was the big news, who was singing Nessa and Dorma from his balcony with an accompaniment track. And those two ideas sort of coalesced for me over the weekend. And I said, don't don't go out there with your small speaker and just do some innocuous jazz. Take the big guns out there. I have this bass amplifier, 500 watts. Take Big Bertha out there and plug it in and just do big visceral encore type opera stuff. That was in early April. Some neighbors asked him to sing again, and then again. And now Wall is on performance number 30. And he's aware that opera isn't of obvious use during a pandemic. It doesn't directly save lives or get anyone closer to a potential vaccine. It's even something he used to joke about with his wife. Back in the early days when we only had one car, we used to negotiate who got the car. You know, she works in medical, so, you know, we'd be debating who got the car. And her trump card was always... There is no such thing as an opera emergency, which was a hard point to argue, you know. But Wall can also point to specific instances where people have reached out to him to tell him that his performances got them through a rough day or gave them something to look forward to. People have come back at me and said, what I'm doing is incalculable. And I'm just humbled by that. Wall keeps his address secret. But neighbors still show up daily, and the only negative review I saw at this concert was from a car that was trying to get people out of the street. Wall puts a surprising amount of thought and care into his performances. He reads the room, so to speak. He stops singing songs that are more upbeat. He finds that most people like that, as he says, gravitas. He also uses his performances as a teaching opportunity and introduces each song with a small story about the piece. Just to sort of give them a visceral, emotional connection, I'm just presenting a sort of a bleeding chunk of the opera and saying, this is at the heart of the show, this is what it's about, and defining it in a sort of a a way that we can all universally understand. You know, I'm really avoiding, Verdi was born in 1813. You know, I mean, forget it. Wall ends each performance with Nessun Dorma, the aria he saw on the news sung in Naples, which inspired him to begin singing on his front lawn two months ago. At times, it feels like there are few things that can be relied on. There are a lot of questions, big ones, about what another address from Washington's governor Jay Inslee will bring. Small ones, like what proper sidewalk etiquette is when you're trying to stay six feet away from someone. It can feel that some days, Wall's 5 o'clock performance is one of the few things you can rely on. I mean, we're all looking to connect to something emotionally, philosophically. We're looking for hope. At the end of the performance, a few neighbors came up and talked to Wall from the sidewalk. People walked their dogs back home, and everyone shared a single hopeful experience. Thanks to Hans Andersen for bringing us that story. 
He's an award-winning audio producer based in Seattle, and his work has appeared on NPR's All Things Considered, Weekend Edition, and KCRW's Unfictional. His middle name is not Christian. Time for a mid -roll. If guided meditation sounds like something you'd be into, we encourage you to check out the podcast Meditation Minis. It's an award-winning podcast focused on reducing stress, improving sleep, and building confidence. Each episode is about 10 minutes long, so it's perfect for a quick break between tasks or to unwind at the end of your day. Listen and subscribe at meditationminis.com or on your podcast player of choice. Back to the show. Like A.J. Amos, the photographer from the beginning of the show, Alfonso Perez spent the first part of the pandemic wondering how his art would fit into the new reality of quarantine life. Alfonso is a Colombian visual artist based in Richmond, Virginia. He was in his living room one day, drawing a picture of his grandmother in an attempt to think about anything but the news, when... I ended up thinking in the middle of that that I needed to use drawing to connect with the situation instead of using it to avoid the situation. And so I usually work with portraits, and I love working with portraits because portraits are a way of talking about certain things just by focusing on one person's story. But then for me, it's, it's always been about trying to work with things that people are not seeing very clearly or like looking at too much. So at that point, the idea of making a portrait of people who had recovered from COVID was really interesting because the narrative around the situation was all focused on the deaths and, uh, and more cases and you need to stay home and everything was just like heavy and, and negative. In the beginning, he turned to the internet to find people he wanted to draw. He looked for news stories featuring photos of people who had recovered. Then he would take out his iPad. It's like starting from a very small scribble to a bigger one. And then just trying to focus also with that gesture or with that movement of, of scribbling in my hand to darker areas or lighter areas or more details or things like that. So the way that the, the image is built and the face is built is almost like layer by layer, line by line. That's a very interesting approach for me because for me, it just means that I'm taking this time, this hour and a half, two hours to be with this person and try to tell the story by building this image of them that would, would, would show a little bit more. But also I think what happens with someone that, that w when people see the portraits compared to seeing, seeing a, a photo or a different type of image is that you can feel that the image has been made out of time and out of observation and out of just kindness. Do you have to work against the photo at all? And what I mean by that is like, there are some pictures of me where I'm like, I do not, I hope, I really hope I don't look anything like that. Um, and I just wonder like if you have to consciously undo a little bit about what you know photography does to the human face in order to make the drawings. Maybe this is too complicated and not real. But. No, no, no. It's super cool because I, I do have to fight a little bit with the picture, but more than with the expression or with the likeness of the person is with the, with the quality of it. Because most of the times these pictures are not uh, on high resolution and they're not, they don't have a, a good background and good lighting or anything. But I have to find a way to define those details in the, in the image through the drawing, which is not a boring thing for me or like a bad thing for me, because I think that it gives me a lot of wiggle room just to create the drawing or like fill in the, that, that gap through drawing and not just by copying what's in there. Do you know these people <laughs> that most you're drawing? Of, <laughs> no, most of them I don't. 
Are there people that you've drawn who have no idea that you've drawn a picture of them? Yes, I, I'm sure. I'm sure. Is that creepy? Mm, no. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> For me, it's not because I feel that the, the, there's there's two main like I don't know goals, but like um like things that activate through the portraits. One is is the fact that I'm sharing um, their their story, like their recovery, and it's not about not looking at at the pain and the difficulty that the situation is bringing is about looking at how we can navigate through this and, and see that there's uh, a recovery at the end. Because if you, if you go into the hospital with COVID-19, not knowing or not having in your mind that you're going to be able to recover or that recovery is common and possible, then it's going to be more difficult. You said that Originally, you were drawing to kind of distract yourself, and now you're drawing to immerse yourself in the situation. How has that been helpful? At the beginning, it was it was also about just finding some peace in uh, creative practice. Somehow, avoiding the situation through drawing was stressing me out <laughs> a, a little bit more my my drawing and and the way that i just connect to the world through drawings has to do with what's going on in real life and there's an adaptation there's a dialogue between the the creative language that i have through drawing and what's happening outside and what's happening with people outside i mean it it, it became a, a practice like a daily practice it became a ritual it became almost a a meditation with with each portrait Alfonso posts the portraits on Instagram. People shared his illustrations there, and attention to the project grew. Soon, people started sending him photos of friends and relatives who had beat COVID, asking him to draw them. One of the first connections that I did, or that I had, was a friend of mine from Colombia. That I, I mean, I, 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 I knew her from when I was a teenager. And we both moved out of Colombia probably 20 years ago or, or more. And she lives in New York. I live here. We've never talked again or anything. Then she shared a photo of her brother, who I also knew from Colombia when he was a, when he was a, a kid. And I ended up doing a portrait of him. And... He's a he's a, um, a paramedic, so he was yeah he was in the middle of, of everything. And I've I've received some messages from people that have seen the the, pro, the portraits, and it's amazing how the first feeling that they get is of recognition of their experience, because I I do feel it's a very tough experience and it's something that nobody's actually recognizing or honoring in any way you know it's just it becomes a number and you recover and you're you're good to go so keep on with your life but what they feel and what they what they tell me is that they feel just proud of having something that is recognizing the, that experience that they've gone through yeah so this is this is a message from martha smith who i did a portrait of hi alfonso I want to personally thank you for your wonderful, wonderful project and the wonderful portrait drawing you did of me. I appreciate you honoring my recovery, which is still continuing for about two more months, but I am out of the hospital for the past two weeks. It was a long 17 days and a lot of hard work in the hospital. I hope you're able to continue to find other survivors of this terrible disease that strikes so quickly and deadly. After hearing all the big numbers of cases and deaths, there isn't much of a focus on those that have actually survived. A few 
weeks ago, Alfonso stopped getting submissions and sensed that it was time to wind down the project. As part of that, he will complete four more drawings expressing hope for recovery. And not just for the people themselves, but for the economy, for cities, the climate, the world. Alfonso says that recovery will require adaptation. I think adaptation is a very important skill just to have there to exercise as a muscle. And, and for me, it's really interesting to see how adaptation is part of, of my daily job and my daily life uh, as an immigrant. You know, as a, as a Colombian immigrant coming here, uh, I adapt to so many things, and, I, and I've adapted to so many things uh, that it becomes it becomes a natural dynamic. It becomes a natural skill. I think that's that's one of the the fundaments of creativity. And I think something that I've been thinking about lately is the connection between recovery and adaptation, and how adaptation has to do with like a very important skill to survive the disease, but at the same time to get through the, the pandemic and the emergency, not just as someone with the disease, but as people, as people that are living in the middle of uh, an always changing situation and who don't know what's going to happen next week. You can see Alfonso's artwork, as well as the portraits of people who have recovered from coronavirus, on his Instagram, at a drawing table. And that is our show. Social Distance Assistance is produced and engineered by June Hartkessel Robinson Jones, Kelly Jones, and Molly Bourne. It was created and edited by Nate Toby. Gavin Wright makes it all happen. Digital assistance from Angela Messino and the VPM News team. Steve Humble is VPM's chief content officer. Music for this week's episode was by Blue Dot Sessions. If you like what you heard, help us out. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts and leave us a rating or review. Special thanks to Louise Keaton from VPM for connecting us with Alfonso Perez. And if you're looking to participate in any musical theater over the summer... DMR is offering a bunch of virtual camps, including Musical Theater Mega Camp. It's a collaboration with theaters and performing artists across the nation. You can find more information at dmradventures.com. Maybe I'll see you there. Members are a fundamental part of VPM. Member support is especially vital right now. Through member support, we are able to provide timely and fact-based information, educational resources for our kids, and informative and entertaining content to keep minds active and engaged. Be a part of what makes VPM possible. Visit vpm.org slash donate to become a member today. What does it take to become one of the world's best young violinists? I technically started on a cardboard box. (laughs) Every two years, musicians under the age of 22 meet for what's nicknamed the Olympics of the Violin. Music in my life opened doors to a lot of possibilities. We'll introduce you to some of these gifted musicians on Making Menuhin, a new podcast from VPM. Subscribe today wherever you get your podcasts and at vpm.org slash violin. VPM.